ground assault that is experiencing lopsided success. But if military victory is all but assured, what of the days after the guns fall silent? Saddam Hussein will likely still be in power. And people can live with uh, Saddam Hussein, provided that his uh, uh, power is clipped. But to what degree should the Allies deplete Saddam's power, his army? Some experts believe if the Iraqi forces are decimated, it could create a shaky power vacuum in the Mideast that the power of the Iraqi army is not completely annihilated because this kind of thing will cause destabilization in the area for the long time. But perhaps the biggest question mark for the United States is not how to pull out militarily, but rather politically. To remain in force, some say, would bring back in Arab minds the days of European colonialism. If that's the case, then we run the risk of having the U.S. and the West look as if they are policemen in the Middle East. And then that plays into all of the cynics who said the main reason that the West went in was for oil and to, in fact, entrench itself more in the Middle East. It'll be a quick military resolution, but a longer-term political resolution. There's no doubt about it. In a region of the world where there are relatively few givens, perhaps one that may exist today, is that the Middle East has been changed dramatically. But what is still very unclear is the role the United States will play in its future. Bill Shields, TV4 Eyewitness News. Closed caption for our hearing impaired viewers. We are grateful to Dunkin' Donuts and Bull Worldwide Information Systems for making this important service possible. The 10 o'clock news is made possible by your contribution and by grants from Nimrod Press, printers and engravers. From New England Telephone, 30,000 people serving New England's communications needs for more than 100 years. And from Shawman, providers of financial services at more than 200 locations across Massachusetts. I'm Christopher Leibniz. And I'm Carmen Fields. Our guest on what we can now call the aftermath of the Gulf War will be the Lebanese lawyer and writer Nawaf Salam. The Gulf War is over tonight. Even the bombing of Baghdad has stopped, and Saddam Hussein can have a permanent ceasefire if he's ready now to release prisoners, locate mines, and pledge some reparations to Kuwait. President Bush tonight announced the victory and ceasefire in a six-week war. Seven months ago, America and the world drew a line in the sand. We declared that the aggression against Kuwait would not stand. And tonight, America and the world have kept their word. This is not a time of euphoria, certainly not a time to gloat. But it is a time of pride, pride in our troops, pride in the friends who stood with us in the crisis, Pride in our nation and the people whose strength and resolve made victory quick. So this is the way the war came to an end. It was a four-day ground war with the most lopsided casualty score perhaps in the history of serious battles. For each one of the 28 Americans killed in the ground war, maybe 500, maybe even 1,000 Iraqis died. 50,000 Iraqis have been taken prisoner. Iraq's army is history. The war ended with cheering in charred Kuwait City, a ghost town that can afford urban renewal. The war ended with shows of defiance elsewhere in the demoralized Arab world. Saddam Hussein still had rooters here in Jordan and in Egypt and in Lebanon. But on the battlefield, where Saddam had promised rivers of blood, the war ended in an ignominious mismatch. Basically, the Iraqis uh, weren't very keen to fight, and as we got further on, uh, they were pathetically pleased to give up and become prisoners of war. That then brings us to today. We have rendered completely ineffective over 29 Iraqi divisions, and the gates are closed. There is no way out of here. There is no way out of here. What's left of the Iraqi army in terms of how long could it be before he could ever be a, a regional threat or a threat to the region again? Well, there's not enough left of the, at all for him to be a regional threat to the region, an offensive regional threat. Those elite so Republican enemy, guards, Schwarzkopf said contemptuously, were just elitists 
they got premium pay and the privilege of positioning themselves where they could bug out of the battle when it got rough. As far as Saddam Hussein being a great military strategist, he is neither a strategist nor is he schooled in the operational art, nor is he a tactician, nor is he a general, nor is he as a soldier. Other than that, he's a great military man. I want you to know that. <laughs> military man. I want you to know that. Before Iraq invaded the tiny emirate Kuwait, it was a place where no political parties were allowed, women couldn't vote, and the press was censored. An experiment in parliamentary government was dissolved in 1986 and the Constitution suspended. But the royal family is regarded as honest and modest compared to their counterparts in the Arab world. But will liberation leave Kuwaitis with a hankering for Western-style democracy? This once was Kuwait. Today, Kuwait has the highest per capita income in the world, by far. And its people have a lifestyle that would sound like nirvana to most Westerners. Because Kuwaitis, who in past decades lived in small desert tents, today can afford almost any luxury that money can buy, and plenty of This them. rich image came to mind when Americans questioned whether her blood should be shed for Kuwait's liberation. Beyond the glitz of the pre-invasion Kuwait, was utopia, according to Professor Farouk El Baz. He calls her the perfect welfare state. In Kuwait, most individuals are educated completely and totally for free, from kindergarten all the way through PhD. And the PhD can be at Oxford University or Cambridge or Harvard, anywhere the student can go. That's not all. Also, the Kuwaitis have complete and total health care for free. The, all of the uh, services for water, electricity, and so on is almost for free. And then every Kuwaiti, as soon as they graduate from college, they get money from the government to start their life. 65-year-old Sheikh Jabir Ahmed Sabah rules Kuwait from exile now. Word has it he wore a $20 watch for years, uses commercial airlines for travel, and his official car until an assassination attempt was a Chevrolet Caprice. His family selects the leader who rules by what Professor El Baz calls consensus. Any individual, any man or woman, could walk in to the high-ranking official, including the emir, in, during some time, during one way of the week, and they can take any of their gripes to him or her personally. So some man can walk out of the street and go to the equivalent of the White House, sit down to the, to the emir and tell him, that your government hasn't done this, we have a problem in our village about, about our well, and we'll need this and this and that, and that has not been done, and here's a piece of paper, look into it. And if the emir can, can fix it on the spot, he would. If he cannot, he will give it to a member of his cabinet to follow up, to follow through later. So this is kind of a democracy that is vastly different from the democracy in the West, and people don't understand it. And when they say, well, but they don't have a, a Senate or a Congress, Yes, they do not, but they have something that is so different. It is equivalent. In some cases, it's even better because no American can walk into the White House and talk to President George Bush about the gripe he has. The Kuwait that the emir returns to is merely a shell of itself, but he will preside over her rebuilding and promises that 80% of the new jobs will go to American firms. And all this talk from Americans about democratic adjustments or new world order, well, that may have to wait a while. What about the liberated Kuwait? Will it be back to business as usual? They brought in the opposition, so to speak, the people that have really been very vocal about all of that, to a meeting in Saudi Arabia, and they discussed the whole thing with them, and they all agreed that the first requirement is to liberate Kuwait, the second requirement is to fix the country, to return back to normal living. And the third requirement, we will discuss that uh, reissuing the parliament and figuring out what, what in the constitution needs to be changed. But what about democracy? Wasn't that some of what the war was all about? Should the new Kuwait be more democratic? The fight was not about uh, democracy or the fight was not about a form of government. The fight was about stopping aggression. And uh, so that was done, and the uh, influences on changing government might backfire. 
Our guest, Nawaf Salam, is a writer and lawyer 